Welcome to this week's edition of The 6-5. I'm Patrick Moorhead with more insights and strategy, and I am joined by my famous co-host, Daniel Newman with Futurum Research, partner, founder, chief poobah, everything. Uh, as a reminder, if you haven't been on the show, uh, 6-5 represents six handpicked topics for five minutes each, all about analysis with a little bit of news to give context to the analysis, but we know you can find news anywhere so go for it. But before I bring in Daniel, I just want to have a disclaimer here. This show is for informational and educational purposes and maybe entertainment purposes only. We will discuss publicly traded companies on the show, but do not take that as investment advice. And as, all, as I always say, just do the opposite. Daniel, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Pat. That was the most succinct introduction of the 6-5 ever. <laughs> we skipped all of the niceties. Uh, oh, we're not done. Jumped jump right in. No, that's we're okay. Uh, we've How been, are you doing, buddy? We've been chronically long over the last few, which has been great because we have so much to say. But hey, we should try efficiency. I keep hearing short and sweet. I keep hearing um, you know things like little social snackable bites. So I don't know, Pat, maybe that quick, succinct introduction on a Monday morning, or maybe it's just because it's Monday and we're recording and not Friday, we're just a little bit more getting down to business. I know. Uh, or I could talk about my travels. I was in Ohio last week and I'm going to be in Florida next. So I am actually getting on the airplane wearing N95 plus uh, the extra uh, medical mask to protect myself, uh, but more importantly, the other travelers around me. So we will be recording, well, I will be recording next week uh, from uh, from Florida, another uh, mobile office. And I will be at home. <laughs> I'm not traveling, I'm not going anywhere. Bunkered down, never leaving. Not ever, just talking tech, buddy, just talking tech. Listen, it's Chicago. You should look forward to that first snowfall in October. Yeah, so. it's coming, buddy. Hey, yep. thanks. thanks for the reminder. That was important. You got it. Let's jump right in. We have some big topics. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is Microsoft Ignite. Uh, Microsoft has many conferences around the year. It has Inspire uh, for its channel partners. It has Build for their development partners. But Ignite is for their customers. Now, because these events are now all digital, in my head, they're all kind of, of blurring. So uh, I would say the highlights of last week from Ignite, uh, probably the biggest uh, biggest things that need some analysis were around power platforms and teams. Yeah, Pat, I would agree with you on that. And first of all, um, and Azure definitely had its, its moments, but um, I've had a lot of time to dig into teams, a lot of time to dig into dynamics uh, and the business productivity apps, power platform. And to your point, huge event, and definitely hard when you're tracking for two or three days. There's just something about when you were live about being able to consume it. And yeah. it's just a little harder when you're remote. But it's been a big year for Microsoft. And of course, the event kicked off. It was uh, Satya Nadella doing the tech intensity run through. I've always been impressed with Satya's abilities to tie together everything in the company stack from, you know, Office 365 to Azure to Xbox and somehow make the story succinct. Got to give the guy a lot of credit for being able to do that because a lot of big tech companies really struggle as their portfolios become so diverse. But, you know, the winner of the day for 2020 uh, in the COVID economy has been collaboration. So let me start there really quickly. Teams got a whole bunch of enhancements, um, you know, and I did a, a run through and I'll put it in the show notes. But a couple of things I thought were really interesting was, you know, there's a lot of data out there right now about meeting fatigue. People are fatigued. They're tired. They're having a hard time staying focused on video conferences all day long. And Microsoft's big announcements, in my opinion, really set out to make the platform more friendly and usable for, uh, for companies and employees that are going to have to stick with the tool and be on these meetings all day long. Um, You've heard about maybe together mode, but they have this new mode now that instead of it looking like square side by side, like we're used to with Teams, Zoom, WebEx, where it's more like a presentation room, it's a classroom, it's a coffee shop, and you can actually talk to people like where it's you talking to a group of people um, in a much more in this really interesting sort of augmented reality enhanced uh, environment. So that's really cool. Another thing that, the, that Ignite announced was breakout rooms, which I thought was also very interesting. 
because, you know, as you're in meetings, meetings always have meetings. So when we'd go to analyst events, Pat, you'd usually have a general session and you'd have a bunch of breakouts. Well, for events, that's become very difficult to do yeah. succinctly. And in, in, a, in a regular work environment, it's even harder. So that was added. Um, they also, you know, enhan enhanced uh, more templates. They increased the scale, meaning the volume of people that would be able to participate in meeting. Um, you've got enhancements uh, that I'm seeing made towards calling. You know, Microsoft didn't really have much of a reputation playing in the, um, you know, in the voice part of this. It was really more of the meetings online and the chat asynchronous. So they're expanding that to really offer a full stack of collaboration. And the last thing, Pat, on the team side was um, analytics that caught my attention. A much deeper dive in analytics. This is actually going to bring up some very interesting conversations because they're starting to track people's work behavior more closely. So for employers, that's great. Uh, understanding how people use meetings is great. I'm still very interested in the uh, process to anonymize the data and to use it in a way where the company can learn about its employees without becoming so creepy that people feel a weird stalking phenomenon that goes on when yeah. they are online. Um, I'll, I'll stop here for a minute because I don't know if you have any thoughts on this and I'll jump over because I also uh, did cover the D365 and Power Platform. Show. Yeah, that's good analysis. And, and I, I'll, the thing, two things I wanted to say is this is the biggest round of announcements that I've ever seen from teams. I really felt like it, it came together for them. And, and I think with teams, you better have a really good reason not to. To use Teams, Microsoft hasn't given you any reason not to use Teams, particularly if you got an, if you have an enterprise uh, uh, contract with them. It was the manager insights that blew me away, and I knew this was coming. I just didn't know when. So whether it's operational resiliency, employee engagement, agility, uh, being more innovative, effective management, uh, accelerating change. Uh, all those buzzwords, those are literally tabs that you're going to be able to click on a as a manager. Now, legally, there is no right to privacy in most countries if you're an employee. But Daniel, to your point, um, if you feel like you're being spied on and creepy uh, as, as an employee, I think uh, uh, at least in the tech sector, employees have a lot more um, pull than they do uh, in, in other areas. And, and I just, I cannot wait because if we're truly going to work hybrid, we have to have different tools to do this. And the only thing that came close to this was what I saw in a, in that Cisco had handcrafted uh, in inside of their own uh, company, hadn't productized it, but the only thing that, that, that came, uh, that came close to this. Yeah, no, absolutely, Pat. And and again, I think the analytics are important. I'm not by any means suggesting employees have a reason to complain, but we all know that transformation and, and, and work productivity happens with strong cultures. And when sure. people feel like they're being, you know, overly watched, it's micromanagement 2.0. So it's all about finding balance. Analytics are the way. Data will make companies better. Um, it was just very interesting to see as remote meetings, remember, um, the old Marissa Mayer shutting down remote work because she didn't like the data she saw on the VPN. This is going to be even more granular. You're going to know even more. Hopefully find a way to harness that and drive business forward. I realize this, this topic's going to go a little long, um, but we have, we'll have a little bit shorter topics in here too to make up for this uh, six by five, uh, which has become like the six by eight half the time for us. But uh, just quickly want to touch on dynamics and power platform. Um, and maybe in our next show, Pat, depending on how much news uh, that we need to analyze comes out, we can talk a little bit about Azure and uh, Windows and some Windows. of the service and some of the other stuff that happened. Yeah. But um, there was a lot that that took place in the Dynamics and Power Platform. Um, first of all, it's just important to note: Power Platform is gaining so much momentum. You hear about low code, no code. Essentially, the citizen developer rules the day, but the company really did focus on sort of these three pegs, right? The citizen developer, someone that's in an app uh, that runs a, a, a you know finance, it could build their own, all the way to a full-on developer working within Power Platform just to create greater economies of scale. And so it's been really focused on, on being able to do all those things. So we saw things like low-code updates um, for pro professional developers. So now you're actually able to see professional developers being able to use the Power Apps environment to build even more powerful apps benefiting from their experience. Um, so while low code is hot, that's definitely been a thing. Um, 
We saw some serious updates to uh, Power Virtual Agents and, and Azure Bot Frameworks. Look, in the future, almost every industry is going to benefit, Pat, from having access to use AI-enabled bots. Um, and the company has really put a lot of efforts into simplifying the incorporation of, of, of chat bots into almost any application you can build in any tool. So you're, you're seeing that take place. Another thing, Pat, and this is the thematic, and since we don't have a ton of time, this is the number one theme I want people to understand. Um, Microsoft Teams is going to become more than just a platform for a collaboration. It is going to become the center of the workspace. And there was hints of this through the announcements of Power Platform and Dynamics 365. For instance, Power BI and Dynamics 365 apps for visualization of data. We're seeing um, automation workflows being built to work inside of Teams. Uh, we're seeing uh, Power BI working natively inside of Excel which now works natively inside of Teams. Um, so we're starting to see these themes, Pat, of availability of uh, power platform driven applications running inside of Teams. And all I keep thinking to myself is if the remote work and this kind of work becomes the future, the ability to chat, meet, calendar, manage, do productivity all inside of a single environment is gonna continue to gain momentum. Teams is not just a, a, a collaboration tool. Teams is growing quickly to become the center of the ecosystem and the advancements to D365 and Power Platform are starting to show proof of how things are gonna live and function. Yeah, that's right, Daniel. Um, it's gonna become essentially uh, where, where all work gets done. Uh, it, it is uh, where all of the corporate applications uh, could be the center point of that. And, and that kind of leads to uh, what my big takeaway is the the further horizontalization. Yes, I, it is a word because I used it um, of of Microsoft. Uh, where if you're a programmer, you can go from no code uh, to a hell of a lot of code on Visual Studio and everything in between uh, with with GitHub, and and that's linking uh, Microsoft Teams, GitHub, Azure. Uh, APIs uh, all uh, together. So uh, it's a one-stop shop. And, I, and there are a lot of players out there with different elements of that, but Microsoft is, is the only company I'm aware that has that end-to-end -end no code to a lot of code. Um, Amazon does have honey code, and obviously they have a lot of code too, but it's at the it's the in-between that uh, AWS isn't necessarily leaning into as hard as, as, as Microsoft. So yeah, we've spent 10 minutes on Ignite. We should probably move. Uh, yeah, let's keep moving. I've got a bunch more to say, but we'll say it another time. You always have a lot to say. You're a I smart know, guy. I know. I but I, I do know good, good lead. Leah, let's hit, um, let's hit uh, Edge and Windows and, and also Azure uh, next week. So uh, let's. Uh, Amazon had a massive um, announcement last week on its devices. Uh, as you know, it is it is the market leader in in smart devices uh, for the home. I'm going to rapid fire go down what they announced, and then uh, I'd like to drill down into two of those. So first off, um, all new Echo Echo Dot and Echo Dot Clock um, that look beautiful. Um, rounded, Eero 6 and Eero Pro 6. These are new uh, mesh Wi-Fi, likely have Qualcomm inside because Broadcom doesn't have that yet. Uh, Ring Always Home Cam, uh, which is a camera that flies around your house. Uh, Amazon Show 10 that actually moves to where you are uh, when you're talking to it, which is, which is cool. A new Fire Stick and Fire Stick TV Lite uh, adding uh, HDR and a better processor, and an improved remote, and uh, a big announcement, which um, my guess is uh, more insights and strategy gaming analysts, uh, Anshul Sog and Mark Vina will get into the Luna Gaming Streaming Service to compete with Stadia and xCloud. But, but Daniel, I think what our listeners uh, would love to hear us weigh in on is uh, the Ring Always Home Cam which some people has called a, a drone. Uh, and, and the second thing I think uh, are the privacy improvements. And that might sound like an oxymoron, a device that can fly around your house, but 
I really feel like the uh, the folks at at Amazon really thought uh, through uh, this uh, this this device, and I was out on Twitter seeing some really erroneous things, and um, um, essentially. I like to think of the home cam as instead of having four or five cameras when you're gone, looking at every room, uh, you have, if, if an alarm goes off in your house, uh, it pops up and flies around, around your pre-patterned uh, flight arrangement and it, and it videotapes. But here's the great thing about the privacy. There's no microphone. So nobody's going to cruise and, and go into the parents' room and, and snoop. It's very loud. So you can hear it if it's flying around, if it happens to launch when you're at home, which remember, it's not supposed to, has a very short battery life, which means it's not going to be hovering outside your room. Uh, the folks at Amazon said maybe five minutes of battery life. Um, they talked about uh, collision avoidance. So it doesn't, you know, even if the pre-flight plan now has a planner in front of it, uh, it's not going to hit it and, 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 and knock it over. You can't fly it as a drone. It is not a drone, Daniel. Uh, you can't sit behind it, or, or it's the worst drone ever, because you can't actually fly it like, like you want. Can't fly upstairs. So net-net, uh, it's, a, it's a flying safety camera. And for my use case, where, where I have a house where I do have five cameras in there in case somebody breaks in or in case my fire alarm goes off, I would only hypothetically need one uh, of of these always home uh, cams. Yeah, Pat, it's it's a really interesting um, <laughs> launch. First of all, I, I, I watched it. I'm really I'm encouraged by Amazon and its continuous focus on bigger world challenges and its role that it wants to play. And I'm, I'm stepping outside the product for just a second here because I watched the whole launch. And I just want to point this out: the, the event started off with about a five minute. Um, program talking about the company's sustainability efforts, how it plans to actually replace the carbon footprint of every Echo device through sustainable energy. I like that. I like that the company um, has really been focused and steadfast on that particular topic this year. You know, some companies come out with a plan, oh, we're going to be carbon neutral, and you don't hear anything from them. Um, so it was worth just pointing that out. I thought it was a really good start. Yeah, that the company keeps beating that drum. It shows just how committed the the organization is. Um, you are absolutely Pat spot on about the privacy concerns. I was live tweeting the event, and the only replies I was getting were people sort of egging me on about privacy. Right. You know, you know more surveillance, and you know, Pat. The thing is, the first thing I say to anybody that says that is, well, do you carry the phone in your room? Like, like if you have your phone with you, why do you care? Because Trust me, whatever is being listened to and heard via the phone and the microphone from Facebook and Amazon. So if you're concerned about one, you it's totally hypocritical not to be concerned about the other. Yeah, that's right. And, and the other, you know, the other piece of that privacy equation, which we, which was great, is that Amazon added the feature that you can automatically delete your voice uh, voice recordings uh, uh, anytime you want, and you you can choose if you don't ever want them to be recorded, which by the way, if you don't do that, I think you're going to have pretty crappy uh, uh, voice recognition capability. And oh, by the way, you can't do that on Siri and you can't do that uh, on, uh, on on Google. So yeah, so I liked the, the product, the idea of it. I have a two-story home. I guess I would need two of them for that to work. Um, not quite, quite sure, but conceptually it was very cool. I, I understand there's no microphone in it. That's which, right. Which is kind of good and kind of bad. Because again, from a surveillance standpoint, I understand why that makes sense. From an actual surveillance standpoint, though, to some extent, if you can't hear what's getting said and it's used in some set type of a security instance, I, I worry about the fact that maybe it needs to be able to catch audio. That's going to. Isn't be that funny? Isn't that funny how we both look at it? Like, like I looked at it, and, and I'm not actually speaking for myself uh, when I talked about all that. I, I want more. I want 15 minute battery life. I want a microphone. I want to fly that bad boy all over my house because I can, and it's, it's cool. Right. Oh. Uh, but, but I think that, that Amazon has touched the stove so many times and the haters have come out and, and kind of put them in your box. And, and you remember when the big, 
scandal came out that that Amazon uh, had real humans that that were checking uh, a voice. And then, uh, you know, even Apple said, oh, we're not doing that. And I even recall Microsoft and Google saying, and then what did we find out? All Everybody of them. Everybody was doing yeah. that, all the services. And that's how machine learning works is you, you have to have humans uh, to do that. In retrospect, uh, should, should there have been something to, to more easily delete those? Because you could always delete those uh, at Amazon before. It was kind of a pain, but you could. Uh, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, Daniel. But um, you know, uh, I, I think uh, Amazon was actually being conservative on this one. Yeah, I want a flying security drone, and next version, I want to put a taser on it, uh, so I can tase the person who's breaking into my home or trying to steal my uh, my French bulldogs. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, I think that that probably will be something Amazon won't do. There probably will be companies that will. Um, I also want to point out that I thought the some of the smart launches, like the vehicle products, yeah. I really like that. Uh, I've, there's so much Ring, uh, so many notifications I get from my Ring community about people trying to break and enter cars. Um, I, I can think about, I happen to like cars and maybe have a nice one or two in my collection. And I would if I do decide to take them out, I would love a better level of surveillance. Sure, a physical impact alarm, you know, to go off is great, but video scares people. And I think when you know you are being recorded um, and there's a high probability that your video is being recorded. I, so I thought that was super clever. Last thing, Pat, the conversational AI showed some real progress. Yeah. Now, having said that, we need to see that in the real world, but the demos, like with the ordering pizza that, that was shown, I really like that because you know, the ongoing stop starts of commands has made AI very choppy, very unusable for people like me. I, I Even my robots need to be intellectual or I won't talk to them. But in all serious, I like the idea of it having ability to turn in the conversation and to continue the conversation and provide feedback and guidance. Um, and so that's a big step in the right direction for the company too. It was an overall very, very solid launch. Amazon continues to be disruptive in this space. And the other thing they continue to be disruptive is they're very much hitting a price point that a lot of the competition isn't. Amazon's not trying to be the high-end premium hardware. They're trying to democratize the technology and make it available in every home, starting with simple Echo Dots that can be put in for sub $50 into every room. And as I said, if surveillance, Pat, and I'll let my last thought, if surveillance is an issue um, with using Amazon, then don't use your phone. I, I, I'm sorry. That's the only thing I can tell people because otherwise there's so much more value than surveillance. And why do you care if Amazon has it and Apple doesn't or if Facebook doesn't? It's, in my opinion, it's all the same. Yeah, you're thinking uh, way too logically, Daniel, yeah. right? Uh, 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 for our own good. Hey, let's move on to the next topic here. And and that this is Qualcomm's en banc uh, motion uh, with, the, with the FTC. Uh, as you know, uh, through a unanimous rule in the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, uh, Qualcomm was found uh, not guilty on on three counts of being a monopolist. But Daniel, it looks like the FTC wants another crack at this. As I said, another bite at the apple. Let's hit this one quick because we took way too long on the first couple. Um, look, FTC is upset. The company, the, the they the, the organization got the right court, the right judge the right situation, and basically won um, its case the first time around on no real uh, evidence that supported its case. Qualcomm's business model is an enabler of innovation. Um, it's an enabler of where we're going with 5G, with connectivity. Um, the What is charged to these OEMs is nominal in comparison to what these OEMs charge the public for these devices. It is not causing harm. Apple, Samsung, Huawei are not struggling to make money selling devices because of anything Qualcomm's doing. But Qualcomm makes 10-year bets with big technology roadmaps and makes its money after, um, long after everyone else, Pat. And so the fact is, is I think the FTC feels uh, bitten by the, the ruling being overturned. But a couple of quick stats, Pat, and I'll turn this back to you. Um, this kind of request is less than a one in 100 odds of ever seeing the light of day, according to you know historical data. Um, the original ruling was three nothing when this was overturned. So the appellate overturn was unanimous. 
Another real red flag for me is it'd been one thing if it was like two to one on a close decision. This was a unanimous decision. So why do they need more judges to hear this thing in order to move forward with it? Seems kind of crazy to me. Last thought, Pat, spend your time. If I was the FTC, you know, all that privacy, let's, let's focus on what's going on with Facebook. Maybe, you know, protecting our elections, stuff like that right now, because frankly, we need this connectivity and we need American companies driving this kind of innovation. And if, if Qualcomm's methods and route to innovation is, is squandered, where's that innovation going to come from? In the US. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. Uh, you, have, you have the FTC that uh, had issues with Qualcomm, who was in, improving on, on its inventions. And then you have a company like Apple, who's charging 30% on the app stores that, that isn't making any improvements to, to, to that product. Um, it, it, it's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. So um, I have fortunately slash unfortunately been involved in uh, uh, major global technology antitrust suits. I was a key witness uh, during uh, AMD and Intel days. Um, I was cross-sectioned for uh, 24 straight hours. The uh, state Texan, Texas maximum allowable uh, by Intel lawyers, that was fun. Uh, and I have to say um, the, the, the evidence against Qualcomm or the judge, the original judgment uh, was laughable. Uh, theories of anti-competitiveness, but not actually any uh, market impact. There was a lot of modem competition was ruled. Uh, prices went down and innovation uh, went up. And last time I checked, uh, you actually had to have uh, evidence of, of at least uh, one of those and they had none. Let's move to another chip maker who had a big payday Nuvia data center chip startup uh, from uh, uh, ex Apple SOC engineers uh, got $240 million from some super blue chip uh, uh, investors. And uh, gosh, you, you may, be, um, may be aware of people like Fidelity, Dell Technologies Capital. Uh, Mayfield, Capricorn, uh, just maybe. Uh, this round was led by Mithril uh, Capital, uh, as you uh, know um, and, and have heard of. Uh, the founders of Marvell, uh, BlackRock, uh, Tomasic, and some additional uh, participation from folks like Atlantic Ridge and, and Redline Capital. So, Daniel, let's just say it again. Semiconductors are eating the world here. It takes software and services and semiconductors to make this world go around. And essentially, uh, this company is showing that, hey, accelerated computing matters uh, when it comes to GPUs and DSPs and, and fixed function accelerators, but the CPU can still be innovated. In, uh, innovated, quite frankly, uh, as it relates to, to CPU performance, it's AMD and Apple the last five years who have pushed the envelope. Uh, and um, these folks uh, who are the uh, principals all came from Apple and they produced the SOCs and the CPUs that uh, came in some of our favorite products and who are knocking out, you know, 25% performance improvements every cycle. And I remember sitting back thinking, this is going to fail. This is going to fail. And, you know, I give Apple a lot of heartache for stuff, but I give them absolute kudos for what they've been able to do with their A series and their and their and their Bionic uh, uh, series. So, um, big payday from these folks, uh, and this is enough money to. It's funny uh, to get samples out. Two, two versions of samples out. <laughs> Just showed you uh, what a big person's game uh, semiconductors are. Yeah, it's a big business, Pat, and it was encouraging to hear new competition entering the space. I've uh, been watching Nuvia from afar. It's a, it's a smaller player, but these are the moments where small players can become big players. And that kind of funding and that kind of financing is a big vote of confidence, significant institutions that don't take bets uh, lightly um, see the potential of getting that 5 or 10x return that's being sought after. So. I'll, I'll turn to you and I'll trust you since I know you work uh, closely with some of the folks over there and you've, you've been advising. Um, but uh, so far, my impressions are 
the market is the money is always a great indicator of where things are going. And this money is flowing because someone thinks this company's onto something good. So uh, I'll, I'll put it on my list like I do for stocks. Watch list. Nuvia. Very yeah, good. no, that's good. And the biggest surprise to me was Fidelity. Right. Fidelity is very conservative. Right. So Fidelity must have seen something that that made this a much lower risk. Uh, and it's crazy. Right. You have AMD and Intel with 98 percent market share and in Intel with uh, about 94% of that, right? So not a lot of competition. So, so they, they did see something. So uh, yeah, let's see where this goes. Pretty exciting. Let's move to another um, uh, chip announcement. And that was that AMD is bringing their Ryzen's to Chromebooks. So a little bit of background here that, that I thought uh, what was important. I've seen, I've been, I have not, I've not exactly been a proponent of Chromebooks, Daniel. Uh, it seems like every step, every two steps that, that Chrome uh, would take forward, they would take one half step back and Microsoft would take two steps forward uh, with, uh, with, with Windows 10. And uh, since COVID, uh, Chrome has been installed, not just in schools, but also in more enterprises than it ever has before and not just in the United States. And one of the reasons for that is, is because if you're an enterprise and you have a web app, there's really not a lot of data that's going uh, on, on, on the books. And, uh, but the problem during COVID was that you just couldn't get an, enough of these devices. Uh, first off, Intel isn't going to burn uh, a lot of its fab capacity uh, when its customers are beating it over the head for higher performance. And unlike the AMD of old, AMD, who doesn't have a fab, isn't going to do bad business either. So what they did is they came out with a version of the Ryzen uh, 7 that from a performance uh, standpoint is anywhere between uh, twice the performance to 2.5x the performance uh, of its, of its um, predecessor. Very low wattage at, at 15 watts. And while that's not fanless, uh, you get notebook, thin and light notebook level performance uh, inside of your Chrome uh, experience. They had uh, quotes from Google, HP, Lenovo, and Acer. Uh, the one person that wasn't in there that you would expect would be Dell. But, uh, you know, Dell is always going to be the last one to uh, to do uh, uh, an AMD move. So I'm hoping this gets, um, uh, I hope we don't have any volume restrictions at least for the next uh, uh, year here. And it's good to see AMD in this. Yeah, Pat, you, um, first of all, Dell will come around. Uh, they will, it will, it will be there sooner than later. Chromebooks are a really interesting play. I've put a lot of weight. A lot of my predictions are about the ACPC uh, project Athena and devices that are lighter, have more efficient battery life, always connected simplicity with so many SaaS and applications that can be run um, in the web browser, the need for a full operating system, especially at scale, when you're talking about students, you're talking about uh, field employees, you're talking about some remote work, people with less uh, intensive application, it, it's a growing category. Um, and so having options that are more efficient, more powerful, more battery, more battery life, uh, you know, lower latency, better connectivity, uh, continued improvement. It's good stuff. Uh, AMD is playing anywhere that volume can be had in PCs. Um, it's why the company has had some success gaining market share and gaining visibility. Um, and, you know, right now with the uh, impending NVIDIA ARM move, I think the company even more so needs to continue to use momentum it has over the next 12 to 18 months, because you can be sure that when that deal is done, competition is going to get harder and thicker for everyone. Um, because that's how NVIDIA plays. So overall, though, I, I realize that's a bit of a sidebar, but solid play. Um, I think Chromebooks, if this isn't the year that it picks up speed, Pat, I don't know when it would be. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. And I'm also I'm also wanting to see if those Chromebooks stick or, or were they purchased uh, just in the short term to where they could get uh, more Windows. So let's move on. Our final topic here is Zapata Computing. Daniel, you wrote a, um, a good piece uh, of insight on your Futurum uh, research called Zapata 
Orquestra brings us closer to democratizing quantum. Very provocative given uh, quantum isn't here yet. And we have a company who's already democratizing it. Tell us more about that, Daniel. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. Um, so here's the thing. We're hearing a lot about things like quantum supremacy right now. We're hearing a lot about uh, the race to qubits, uh, fidelity. Look, quantum is in its earliest days and it has the potential to make a big impact on us. Uh, companies like Honeywell, IBM, Google, all at the forefront. You've got uh, Azure offering a uh, simulation on Honeywell um, and on uh, Rigotti and different uh, quantum computers. You have Amazon with Bracket offering simulation. So it's starting to make way. But here's the big problem, Pat. We think about computing through the lens of an application. You need a terminal, you need a, a web app, you need a, an application, you need something to see. Um, you want to visualize data. You want to visualize the app. Um, quantum, you've seen the machines. These things look like something that belong in a, in a factory that's stamping out vehicles, not necessarily we thinking about in a lab or in a, on a trading floor. So while you hear about JP Morgan Chase and you know BBVA and these banks using quantum, the machines hadn't translated yet to something that the human could interact with. Well, Zapata is essentially you know, a, a lead up in Boston, you know, the brainchild of folks from Harvard and MIT types that have built software that are essentially allowing people to interact with quantum computers through simulation, through what's called um, like hybrid, which would be a hybrid, not in the case of cloud, but hybrid in terms of classical computing and quantum algorithms. Um, and it's it provides that platform to be able to use software to interact with any quantum machine, which is another thing, right? Because you know there's different types. There's ion trapping and then there's superconducting. And you know, IBM and Google are doing it one way. Ion Q and Honeywell are doing it another way. But really when, when problem solving is trying to be accomplished with quantum, so say we're trying to understand compounds for COVID, we're trying to understand how to you know um, create greater levels of, of, of fraud reduction inside of the banking system, we want to tap every resource at our disposal. And what uh, Zapata is basically doing is it's taking libraries of algorithms for both classical computing and quantum computing, making um, it available for you to import your own or use others, uh, run them through simulations and, and benefit from the capabilities in both quantum and um, classical. So it's really complicated stuff. It is, you know, you and I have spent the last year plus working with some of the makers in the quantum space, trying to get our arms around it. But the one thing I always remember, Pat, from the first briefing I took on quantum to now, where I feel much more well-versed on it is, I always kind of wondered, how do you see it? How do you go into your um, you know, Dynamics 365, Salesforce, SAP, Oracle interface, right? And look at what you're doing, create a, a, a low code, no code algorithm. And now we're starting to hear it. This is kind of how it's being done. This is the GitHub meets uh, business intelligence meets, uh, you know, web application and saying, hey, we're starting to get to the point where if you're smart enough to understand this, you can start to use it and, and start to see results. Yeah, that's good. I think that's a great uh, summary, Daniel. Uh, anything anybody can do to make it easier, uh, we, will uh, we will have it before you know it. And it's not just about the hardware. It's also about the, uh, it's also about the solution. And I think that factors in here uh, in a in a big way. Daniel, we have reached our time limit and shockingly we are over again. Can you believe it? Uh, but it has been uh, a great time and, and folks, if you like what you heard, uh, please uh, press that subscribe button, uh, share it with your friends. Heck, find uh, Daniel and I uh, on Twitter and uh, and tell us uh, what you'd like to, to hear next. Uh, give us some constructive feedback as well. We really appreciate our audience that's uh, rapidly building, particularly on, on YouTube, but uh, we, we appreciate you.